Hey, everybody, I'm Nick Latum. And I'm Leah Bonima. And we're the hosts of Were You Raised by Wolves? Each week, we try to make the world a kinder, nicer place. Well, that's the idea, at least. I mean, we try. Have you ever wondered what to do if you're ghosted? Or what to do when a friend asks you to borrow money? Or the proper way to eat Cheetos? You know, the big questions. So please find Were You Raised by Wolves wherever you listen. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. This is What Doesn't Kill You, Food Industry Insights. I'm your host, Katie Kiefer, and today we're talking about, oh, guess what? We're talking about water. Are you surprised? How many of you have been tuning into my water series, which has been going on for, oh, I don't know how many weeks now, but um, today I have like a really great guest. His name is Upmanu Lal. He is a professor, and at the moment, he is the director of the Water Institute at the Julianne Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory at Arizona State University. He is also a professor in the School of Complex Adaptive Systems within the College of Global Futures, and prior to joining ASU in January of 2024, God, I hope you didn't have to move out there. Lal was the Allen and Carol Silberstein Professor of Engineering at Columbia University and served as director of the Columbia Water Center. He developed and led a global water sustainability initiative, a global flood initiative, and the America's Water Initiative. His other uh, academic successes are too numerous for me to elucidate in this. Otherwise, we would spend the whole 45 minutes talking about what an incredible brain he has. But <laughs> Professor Lal, thank you so, so much for joining me today. I'm excited to talk to you about the snapshot of the world's groundwater challenges, because that's what I read in preparation for this conversation. Um, it was published in 2020, for those of you who were curious in following up on this, and it is in the Annual Review of Environment and Resources. Um, thank you so much for writing that, and thank you so much for the work you're doing about what I believe to be the most important issue of our time, actually, besides climate disruption in, in the large. Um so um, let's start by talking about the current state of groundwater in the United States. How worried should we be about our groundwater? Oh, we should be worried. Simply. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, the best way to get that across to people uh, is that when we talk about water, we talk about what's available in quantity, but we assume that it's also of quality sufficient for us not to be poisoned, right? So those are the two things. Right. Um, I would say that in terms of quantity until, you know, maybe around 2000 or so, um, there were a few places where groundwater levels were dropping. And so, you know, everyone kind of talked about that. Uh, so, and those places were Central California and the Ogallala Aquifer in the Midwest. Right. But as you come into today... We are in a in an interesting situation where if you look at large metropolitan areas in the Northeast, uh, along the Mississippi River, places that we have traditionally thought of as, uh, you know, flood prone, not, yeah. not drought prone, we have groundwater levels dropping there. Uh, and that's because people are, you know, particularly in suburban communities are relying on that because groundwater is cheaper to develop. Historically, it has had better quality. You don't need to treat it so much. So if you build a new fancy schmancy subdivision, mm -hmm. you go to it, right? Right. So that's one dimension of what's been happening. The other dimension is that uh, the quality dimension. So as you start sucking something down, if there were certain contaminants in there already, such as arsenic, um, the smaller amount of water there, same amount of arsenic released from the soil means higher concentration of arsenic, oh, possibly, sure. right? So that's, that's one simple idea. The other is that, uh, especially in agricultural areas, so that would be the Midwest, the Southeast, mm -hmm. actually pretty much anywhere, uh, <laughs> the, the mentality we have globally, it's not just a U.S. thing, is yeah. that if I apply fertilizer and pesticide and I get more crop uh, and less damage to the crop, I should use more of it. 
So right. what then happens is that when it rains or when you irrigate, much of that stuff is mobilized. It's yes. either ending up in rivers or it's going in groundwater. If it ends up in rivers, the river water infiltrates into the groundwater anyway. Yep. So all of that mix is a nice little cocktail that goes in. And sometimes <laughs> you wonder, you know, if you're pulling up stuff which already has fertilizer in it, and that's what you're applying to your field, maybe you can tune down what you have apply to be a bit lower because it'll save you money. That's radical. Right? That's very yeah. radical. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that's that's my quickie answer to that one. But that doesn't that concept doesn't get a lot of traction. Nobody's talking about that. Like when you go to an no. ag extension school, they're not saying, well, there's so much fertilizer in the groundwater, maybe you should dial back your fertilizer use on your crops. Nobody is saying that apparently. Yeah, on the technical side, there has been movement. So there is an outfit called the International Fertilizer Corporation out of Atlanta. And they were developing, uh, I haven't talked to them in a while now, but so I don't know what happened to that project, but they were developing um, these fertilizer nuggets. And the idea was that you would put them in uh, at the time that you till the soil. And so they would sit there and they would slowly, you know, just like a capsule, slow release capsule, they would slowly right. release fertilizer over time. So you would not have the surface application of fertilizer that would then have runoff and things like that. Yeah. But I think, I wonder if, you know, as we have moved to no-till as the popular thing, did we lose that thread? I, I have no idea what happened. Right, right. That's a good, I mean, it sounds like a great product. But also it would like, if you're in the Midwest or in... Um, the Southeast even, you know, one of the big ploys that they use to sort of justify concentrated animal feeding operations is that they use all of that effluent to quote unquote fertilize, which also goes into our groundwater and running right. water supplies. Yeah. So you'd yeah. have to, you'd have to persuade the guys who are pumping those lagoons out that that's, that's not the answer either. And many of them make money off of that. So that's anyway, right. yeah. <clears throat> How how do we? I mean, let's let's sort of go to the basics here. Like, how do you measure groundwater, given that it's underground? I mean, I, I read in that paper that you wrote with you know your colleagues that there are um, satellites where you can image water underground, but how accurate are those, and how good a picture do they give? Yeah, that's an outstanding question. So uh, I I'm going to backtrack this a little bit, and then please we'll come back go ahead. To it. Uh, so I started teaching in 1981 and I was 25 years old. So, you know, I was bright, bright eyed, bushy tailed or whatever you call that. <laughs> and so I, I decided I'll go to meet with the state water resources director in Utah. And uh, they were talking about bringing in Colorado River water into the Salt Lake Valley. And I was thinking, huh, we should look at whether, you know, we can manage groundwater locally and do we really need this large interbasin transfer? Uh, and so I went and talked to this guy and he was maybe 50, 55 years old. And his first thing was, you know, son, uh, we can't see that stuff. Why are you talking about managing it? <laughs> <laughs> so <I was> going, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good start, you know. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. So, so basically what we have is an is a network of wells that are not being pumped. They're just holes in the ground that the USGS and state agencies operate. And they can take, you know, samples from that periodically so that you can get a measure of the background water quality and how it's changing. And you get the depth to water. Uh, so that's historically been our way of measuring how much groundwater is there. And mm. you can imagine that a six inch pipe going into the ground in a particular place is not exactly the most representative way to measure this. No. So that's, you know, what we have done traditionally. And so the data is really sparse. And then, you know, the money to dig more of these wells and keep track of what's going on is not there. Um, so the innovation that, you know, people at NASA and my colleague, Jay Fermigliotti, have done is to try to backtrack uh, from gravity measurements and rainfall measurements and evaporation measurements, what is going on with groundwater. And the basic idea is very simple. 
uh, we measure rainfall, we measure evaporation, mm -hmm. and we measure the change in mass of something uh, that's on the ground uh, from the satellite. So the diff so the difference between precipitation, evaporation, and uh, the change in mass, then you attribute that to groundwater because that's probably where it's coming from. It's mm -hmm. tricky. These people are doing clever things there, but it's still tricky. And so basically what happens is that they put out estimates that are over a box size of 250 by 250 kilometers, very big areas. Yeah. Right. And so they 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 keep trying to now you know uh, improve the scale of that information, but I think it's still very tricky. It's, it would be much better to directly measure it. And I I have a feeling you're going to lead up to this question, so I'm going to answer that uh, right now. <laughs> Go right ahead. And that is that uh, how do we know who's using this, right? And yeah. How much? And the answer is that would be the thing to do, but there's been pushback from people on doing that. And it's uh, kind of crazy because, you know, we are spending so much money monitoring things and so on, but we don't monitor the amount that somebody is pumping, except in a few states in the U.S. Um, and to install a meter on each well so that you would know exactly how much is being pumped, this is not expensive. Uh, uh -huh. And we would have a direct measurement. So that would be the way to know what's going on with groundwater because when somebody stops pumping, they, their, their depth to water is recordable very easily. So sure. you would have, you have millions of pumping wells in the US, tens of millions of pumping wells in the US. So if we actually were, you know, asking those people to report what their water levels are and how much they have pumped, we would actually have really good information and we could, you know, address questions of equity. We could address questions of where we should allow what to happen. But since th those people suspect that they would be shut down, there there is opposition to doing that. Of course there is. I can just imagine how, say, I don't know, a large agricultural company like Archer Daniel Midland or Cargill would feel about measuring how much water they're using in their various and multitudinous processes processes, right? I mean, between growing grain or slaughtering animals, I mean, that's a lot of water use. Yeah, I think a company like that knows exactly how much water they are using. They don't want anyone else to know. Necessarily. Right. So if you could change that culture, you know, and that's something some, you know, a, a journalist like you could work on. Uh, if you can change that culture so that as corporate responsibility, uh, you know, you're doing a great job of improving your water usage. Let us know. <laughs> right, right. Let's we'll give you a special pat on the back and a lollipop for it. I mean, you know, we have to have a carrot. There's got to be a carrot incentive. Yeah. I mean, there are companies I like for. I mean, to be fair to Cargill, for example, um, do you? I don't know if you know. Of course, we're going on one of my many tangents, and I apologize. But there is an organization called Ceres, like you know Demeter, the the Roman name for the goddess Demeter, Ceres, and Ceres is a company that. Um, that does, in fact, monitor water usage and has developed, they they published a paper quite a few years ago now, I'm sure you saw it, about uh, industrial use of water and how there should be some monitoring of this. And, and multiple companies uh, were surprised by how much water they use, didn't realize how much water they use and recognize that they have to uh, figure out a way to manage their water use so that they can continue to operate in the future. Now, where that has gone, I don't know. But at the time that this uh, study was published, it had some very compelling um, uh, both questions and answers, but also compelling participation from big companies like Cargill. Um, but I, you're not mentioning it, so I guess <laughs> I oh, no. guess, See, guess they didn't uh, get that far with it. Outfit. Yeah, series is a great outfit. And in fact, their water work is led by Shama Parveen, who's a former colleague of mine. Oh, is that Colorado. right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, they I mean, they made they paid lip service. In other words, some of these companies paid lip service to the idea of, yes, if we don't manage our water supplies now, we won't have any in the future. Um, and there seemed to be quite a bit of interest in actually uh, addressing the issues. But I, I don't know where it has gone. Are you aware of any um, any internal efforts by these companies, even if they're not publishing the data? I think that almost all these companies have developed internal efforts uh, on 
monitoring water and doing something with it. Um, their CSR efforts actually are notable for many companies. Internally, what they are really doing, you know, that I think is quite variable because for a lot of companies, they, re they realized very quickly that their internal water use was dwarfed by their external water use. And by that, what I mean is, for example, if you're PepsiCo, uh, you know, or Coca-Cola or, or Nestle or a company like that, right. uh, they are manufacturing cookies, chips, et cetera, and, so, and, and bottled water and soda pop. So the amount of water that's consumed in, inside the operation, manufacturing those things is really small compared to the water that went into the sugar that they are using, of the course. water that went into the corn they are using and so forth. Right? Yes, right. So once they realize that, uh, either they have tried to push their suppliers to some extent, or um, they they have create tried to create offsets in some ways. So that's kind of what has happened. I see. I see. Very interesting. Um, you know, another thing that um, you pointed out in the article that I referenced at the beginning of the show, which which led me to create this outline, was the number of pollutants in our groundwater, which. <clears throat> but are both naturally occurring in the soil, if I understood that correctly, things like arsenic or fluoride, um, and on through what we contribute, which are you know agrochemical, hormones, medications, wastewater. Can you? I, I, I was hoping you could take us through some of the challenges to clean water and sort of how these products get into our water supply, and how successful municipalities can be in taking them out again. Yeah, so this is a huge topic of, of itself, right? Yes. So <laughs> I excel so at those kinds of questions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, so so l let me do it by example rather than abstract. Go so, right ahead. You know, Bangladesh, uh, for example, has the world's most notable problem with arsenic in groundwater. Uh, so if we think about you know, how this actually got manifest, it's interesting. Uh, Bangladesh and India have similar situations. So historically, you probably know about these Persian wells, which is basically a Persian wheel that uh, there's a whole bunch of small buckets on it. It yep. goes into an open well, a bull or a human, you know, uh, moves this and uh, water comes up and there's a little flume and the water falls on it from the buckets. And from there, it goes to wherever it's going to be used. So okay. these are open wells and people have been drinking from them for a long time. And so uh, the first problem that they wanted to solve was that often in these open wells, because of a place like Bangladesh, which gets flooded very easily, yep. and this is tapping shallow groundwater. So there's a lot of fecal material that gets in there. Mm. So people were always getting sick. Uh, from biological agents, let's say. So they mm -hmm. wanted to solve this problem and they started by uh, developing, uh, the British Geological Survey facilitated this and they started developing deeper but still shallow wells that were like hand pumps. And uh, so there was a technique developed where it was really simple for them to dig these wells in the sedimentary environment, mm -hmm. uh, basically, you you end up creating a device that is drilling the well by having two people on a seesaw jump up and down on either end of the seesaw and oh then you God. know okay. moves down. That right. works. So yeah, it works. Uh, and so they go down 30, 40 feet instead of uh, you know having an open well. It's now a tube that is going down, and then you use right. a hand pump to bring the water up. So this then profligated uh, through the whole country. And suddenly there were millions of people who were being exposed to arsenic, which was in the sediments. Uh, wow. The sediments here are what are called braided sediments. So what you have is uh, over, this is a delta. So over time, you know, you either get fine material like clays being deposited, or uh, if there's a not as wet period, then you have clays being deposited, but when you have a wet period, you have coarse sediments like sand being deposited. And so then this, these, these historically over time have formed like rope-like structures. So you have sand, clay, sand, clay, you know, and it's all intertwined with each other. The arsenic exists at the surface of the clay. So when you pump, uh, 
the water moves through the sand. It doesn't move very well through the clays, but it strips sure. the arsenic from the clay. And that's how this is coming in. Uh -huh. So that became a problem. And people were wondering, you know, what's going on. And so the hunch that several of us, including I had, was that it wasn't really the the drinking water wells that were mobilized, the, this arsenic, because this is just a hand pump. It can't move water that fast. In a right. Way. Uh, but what also happened, you know, as the, as this development took place was that farmers started putting in irrigation wells that, you know, and th those are diesel powered, you move a lot more water. And mm -hmm. as you start moving that water, probably you're mobilizing more and more arsenic, which then comes into uh, these drinking water wells. So mm -hmm. that was kind of the exposure pathway that has developed. There is not a whole lot you could have done to prevent that because the arsenic's already there. Mm. So what, how do you solve this? And it's interesting how different people have approached this. Uh, if you're Procter and & Gamble and you make chemicals uh, or, you know, another company that makes chemicals, the answer is that you need an oxidizing agent that could then precipitate the arsenic out or convert it into a different isotope of arsenic, which is not toxic. So mm -hmm. these tablets could be circulated for uh, 25 cents for 100 tablets and each tablet treats you know, five liters of water or whatever. Interestingly, I mean, this seems like not a bad solution, right? Because you're not yeah. creating a treatment plant infrastructure. You just have to come up with a mechanism to distribute these tablets and they're cheap enough that the population can afford them. Yes. But interestingly, this was opposed by many people as a techno solution. And so I was curious to see what what's the alternative. And their alternative was, we need to continuously sample these wells. And if the well has good water, we will paint it green. And if it has bad water, we will paint it red. And that boggled my mind. Like, the water is moving. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But, yeah, I know. It's yeah, interesting. boggling. Insane. Yeah. So, so, so you run into this stuff where uh, there's like, a, you know, and then there was a whole drama about, well, the population is Muslim, women carry water. Are the people going to be happy going to a well that's in somebody else's house and their, their wife goes in there and so on? And I was going, hey, wow. I don't understand why you are even creating this dimension of a problem. Just distribute the damn tablets. Absolutely. But, you know, <laughs> they are still, they're still not solved. So I think the, the challenge here is that when it comes to solving these problems, uh, the solution pathways uh, going through public health channels or going through community channels start becoming tedious. And so I've sort of gravitated to the point of view that uh, if you can afford it, getting a simple device that is uh, like a you know, is at the level of an appliance that anybody can use is better than getting right. through a whole human chain of events because humans, you know, can do crazy things. So anyway, that's sort of one story. Uh, the the, the man-made pollution going in, uh, as you know, partly why I started with that story is that that's the way it existed in nature. So now if you start adding uh, pollutants of human origin into the mix, you can imagine the pathways of exposure are not different. Oh, absolutely. Um, pumping that stuff, it's, it's the same as the way you were pumping arsenic back up. Yeah. Um, so ultimately, you know, there are two points of responsibility. One is, can you control the source of the pollutants that you're adding into it? Um, and the second is that, can you treat them at the end of pipe, so to speak, and get them out? Uh, what we have learned over the years in environmental engineering is that uh, controlling the pollutants before they get into the system is cheaper yep. and more effective. So why are we not doing it? Uh, you know, good question. We, yeah. we try to do it, but we are not succeeding on that because the number of pollu the, the number of uh, man-made contaminants that we have managed to create um, exceeds the rate at which we come up with policies to remove them. So, yeah. so we have this. And so the reason it's you know more challenging to remove them end of pipe is that if I look at the cost of removal, when the thing is reasonably concentrated, I can remove 90% of that contaminant fairly cheaply. It's the last 10% that is hard okay. uh, to get out. Uh, when I'm looking at end of pipe, I already have enough dilution. So I'm looking at that last 10%. So I have to end up with a much more expensive process to remove it. 
Mm-hmm. However, there's one silver lining on all this, which is that desktop reverse osmosis systems, like you go to Amazon and you can buy a thing that you put on your kitchen counter and it has a little pump in it. It pressurizes the stuff and it runs it through a very fine membrane. And uh-huh. uh, those things have become uh, relatively inexpensive. So for around $200, you can buy, you know, uh, and, and it's... It, the, the company that makes it is it, is not particularly relevant because they all come from China and that they are branded some, somehow here. But uh, mm-hmm. those devices have become cheap enough and effective enough uh, that at least in the U.S. context, most families can afford that. Uh, it's a better alternative to, you know, the simple filter, like a beta filter that you pour the water through. Sure. Uh, it costs a little more in the beginning, but I think the life cycle costs are not that bad. So... In terms of end of pipe, if we wanted to use a high-end device for drinking and don't worry about treating everything that goes into, you know, the toilets, the laundry and the uh, shower, I think we have a solution. But if we wanted to treat everything to drinking water standards or to to eliminate contaminants, that's going to be really hard. Yeah, really hard. And as you pointed out, there are many people who don't want to hear about that. And I'm thinking, of course, of agriculture, because um, one of the areas that I've focused on in the last six months in this series is is Iowa, which has, you know, incredible, I know you know this, um, incredible groundwater problems. And they're now discovering that it's also kind of a cancer cluster state. They have the second highest rate of cancers in the country, um, which they are now beginning to think. Uh, are due to the agrochemicals in the water supply. Um, but there's no way of, uh, you know, the, the agricultural companies that are the culprits in this, they certainly do not want to be on the hook for cleaning up their agricultural pollution before it comes into the end of my pipe, as it were, right? I mean, there's been a yeah. tremendous amount of pushback uh, just because agriculture is completely unregulated uh, the way other industries are regulated. Um, so you, the other thing that scared me about what you were talking about was the metals mining, because we do a lot of fracking here. We do a lot of coal mining here. Um, and in your paper, it said there were over a billion releases, uh, from metal mining and that there were over 8 million releases from coal mining. What, what are the impacts of those events on groundwater and what do we do about that? If anything, gosh, you know, that's another hard one. So, mm-hmm. again, doing it by example rather than abstract. Um, when I was working in Utah, um, there's the largest, one of the largest coal mines in the world historically has been Kennecott Copper in Salt Lake City. You can see the mine from, from the moon, basically. Wow. <laughs> it's really? that large. Yeah. And so, what happened there was that. Salt Lake City is, you know, what's called Salt Lake City is actually a relatively small area in the Salt Lake Valley, uh, on the, uh, principally on the east side of the valley. And then Salt Lake County is a much larger area that covers that whole thing. And so over time that, you know, as more and more people started moving into that area, it started developing further to the west. And uh, to the west are mountains and to the west is the Kennecott Copper Mine. Uh-huh. So what they had been doing was that they basically dig up the ore and then they use uh, sulfuric acid as a leaching agent to separate it from, you know, whatever right. is there. Uh, from 1940 onwards, they had built a dam where all this concentrated sulfuric acid was stored that had already run, been run through the process. Uh-huh. And... Uh, this was permitted, apparently. And then when the Clean Water Act came in and these guys were to be regulated for that, that particular facility, as I understand, was grandfathered into it because <laughs> it existed. Uh-huh. So what's, what happened over time is that that acidic water ate through the limestone that was there that would have been a buffer. You know, that was kind of the concept was uh, sure. you have limestone plus acid and you end up with neutral calcium uh, sulfate, gypsum out of that. Anyway, what really happened was that neutralization happened, but it basically ate through that, and then it got into the aquifer. So when these developers Ooh. started building houses, you know, in the West Valley there, they yeah. tapped groundwater. And uh, 
they didn't really realize what would happen because once they started pumping that groundwater, kids started getting sick, people started complaining. And then when somebody checked, uh, the pH of the water, which is a measure of acidity, in mm. some places was as low as three, uh, when neutral is seven. So just to explain that, this is a logarithmic scale. So three means that the acidity, three compared to seven means that the acidity is 10,000 times what is there in natural water. Think about Whoa. that. Right? Whoa. So basically this is a highly corrosive. So when these people were pulling up that water, they were drinking acid that had been diluted to a certain extent, but still acid. Yeah. So the, the proposal back from Kennecott Copper at that time was, oh, well, we'll just pay a natural resources damage claim because eventually all this water is going to go into the Great Salt Lake, which is, you know, highly toxic anyway, so who cares? Uh, now, think <laughs> about that. You know, basically, they're saying that over thousands or millions of years, this problem will dissipate of its own accord. Thank you very much. Yeah, and right. so, okay, we'll just pay. Water is cheap, so we'll just pay for the water. Uh, and this... This was, you know, accepted by the state of Utah, which was amazing to me. Yeah. Um, and then, it, and then, it, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back to the early 90s is when early mid 90s is when this was happening. So the state accepted it. Uh, luckily, the U.S. EPA woke up to this story and decided to sue the state of Utah, and this agreement was nullified. Now, one of the reasons the state of Utah accepted this game was that, oh, this is one of the major parts of the economy of the state. They employ so many sure. people. They go bankrupt. You know, this is a bad news. Well, they did go bankrupt, sort of. They just got bought by different groups, British Petroleum and then Rio Tinto. So they are still operating. And... Um, what depressed me was that last year I read a news item which said this is still being litigated. And by the way, there's now a, a major cancer cluster. Jesus. So, yeah. So this, you know, this is, this is a storyline which basically says that we recognize the problem. People yeah. try to do something about it. And 30 years later, we are still there. Right, right. Because the court system moves at whatever pace it moves at. And because corporations have enormous pockets and small communities don't. And that's, yeah. you know, I mean, it's, it's that. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back with Professor Lal. We're going to talk more about our groundwater and maybe about some solutions, I hope. Stay tuned. So we're going to skip ahead here. I, I do want to just before we close, because we only have about 10 minutes left. <clears throat> tell us about how climate change slash disruption is affecting our groundwater quality. Because I know now, this that, is like, a tough one. Yeah, yeah, that's a big issue. That's a really big one. So let's let's go into that for a minute. So I, I am not quite sure that we have a great handle on this in terms of surface water quality. Uh and more specifically, changes in dissolved oxygen in rivers. Yes, I think we have a story because what happens is that as as you warm the water, it can't hold as much oxygen, which uh -huh. means that uh, you know. And the, if if you have warmer conditions over a longer period of the year, things like algae also love growing more yep. rapidly. And so they deplete oxygen. And then since the water can't hold oxygen as well, you end up with depletion. So that story is very clear. With groundwater, it's not as clear, uh, but with quality, with quantity, what we are seeing with climate change is that you have more intense rainfall events yep. and more uh, and longer periods between them. And so what that translates into is that we get less recharge uh, going into the groundwater system mm -hmm. uh, because the rate at which water can enter the soil is limited. And so if you end up with a much higher rainfall rate, that's just going away. So hypothetically, what should happen is that we probably end up with uh, more concentration of pollutants uh, in, in groundwater because you're not getting as much water in. Mm -hmm. And you end up with lower groundwater levels uh, as well. 
but the data doesn't exist right now to be able to say this definitely. Mm. So that's still an ongoing investigation is to sort of yeah. be able to model <clears throat> what you think is going to happen as the, you know, the atmosphere continues to warm and we continue to have these extreme weather events, which obviously have a big impact on water, including drought, not just flooding, but drought too, right? I mean, exactly. and then, then you have uh, salinization, you have salt water infiltration in a lot of places. I think that's happening right now in Louisiana, yeah. is it not? Yeah. So, I mean, these are all things that are ongoing that really are poorly understood, if I take your meaning correctly, um, and which will require a great deal more investigation. Let, let's talk for a minute about, like, what do you see... What what are what do you see happening? Like uh, with building on that idea of like we're seeing all of these changes, we don't really fully understand them. W what's next? Like how are you as a professional in this field? Like what do you see are yeah. the next steps for your fellow so, wizards? Yeah, so I you know I think one of the things that concerns me is you you're going to ask me about solutions, and what <laughs> that's really great because what happens is that much of the talk and what media pays attention to and hence you know what keeps getting talked about are the problems we don't yeah. get to the solutions talk very much and right. so as a result the nice thing that has happened is that there's much greater awareness of the groundwater challenges and the surface water challenges and climate now than there was 30 years ago so that's wonderful but what has happened is that since we have, you know, got into got into an uh, age where everyone is a media genius now, uh, <laughs> everyone has become more and more sophisticated about how they talk about the problems. And, yeah. you know, you have beautiful pictures of those going on. And we, we really do not have a movement on the solution side, which is sad. So there, on groundwater specifically, one of the things that I've been thinking about is, it's very simple. If you think about how your money operates, you get a paycheck and you create a savings account and you spend money from your paycheck, but periodically you dip into your savings because you have to. That's why you're creating savings, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's critical that you have savings because all the people who are in deep trouble or homeless are because they were not able to create savings at all. Right. So in, in the current conversation of, uh, that we are having, the groundwater is our savings account. It takes a thousand years to get water into the ground uh, to build those aquifers. And the reason I say that is that you can do age dating of the water that we are pulling out. And really? much of the water we are pulling out went into the ground a thousand years ago. That's wow. you know, the hundred years to 10,000 years is the age range of the water that we typically pull out. So what that means is that if you pull it out, uh, we are out of luck. So what I've been advocating is that we need a national approach to groundwater because we don't have one. And the way to do that is that we declare that just like we have a national strategic petroleum reserve, yes. we need a national water reserve. Now, that doesn't mean that we basically go to Iowa and pump in water from the Great Lakes and pump in water from wherever and dump it into, you know, an aquifer in Iowa. What it means right. is that we have a spatially distributed uh, strategy which says that every county needs to come up with a plan by which it will have a water reserve that gets it through uh, the worst drought that we have seen in the last 2,000 years. And that that plan effectively is going to be a combination of groundwater and surface water reserves. Mm -hmm. But the surface water reservoirs, we basically operate on a seasonal basis or on a two or three year basis. This is something we are going to operate to deal with a 10, 20 year drought. And by the way, we've had those in living mm -hmm. memory, not just paying yes. life. Uh, you know, so we have to think about doing it that way. And then, of course, we have to ensure the quality of that reserve because without that, we are in trouble also. Yes. So California started a strategic groundwater management initiative. Arizona has had something like that, Nebraska. But all of them have struggled because there is no enforcement mandate. There is not really... Mm -hmm. uh, clear strategy. It's like, oh, we are going to declare an active management area and you need to come back with some plan. 
but it's sort of up to you, you know. And mm-hmm. I think by do by by declaring a national strategic reserve that is going to be regulated and managed nationally, but with local uh, incentives and local uh, strategies that feed into it. We've we've done that with the Safe Drinking Water Act. We have done that with the Clean Water Act. Uh, and we can argue that those things are inefficient, but at least they exist. We we do, and we need something like that for uh, for groundwater as well. Mm-hmm. So, because you know, once you have a policy, then the instruments for how to implement that policy and the money for implementing that policy appear. When you don't have a policy, basically, it's a free for all, and we are still there. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the the books. The, the laws that govern uh, water usage in the West, say in Colorado, Cal- Southern California, Arizona and stuff, are based on laws that were passed in the 19th century. And I don't think they've been updated, have they? I mean, it's kind of no. a first come, first serve. And as you pointed out at the top of the show, nobody is measuring how much these agricultural entities are pumping. I'm thinking right. about Imperial Valley. I'm thinking about all of the avocado and almond trees, for example, that have gone in, or or all of the alfalfa that's grown in Arizona and Southern California for even other countries. You know what I mean? And it's like depleting their groundwater uh, rapidly, and nobody is measuring how much they're taking out of the ground that I know of. Yeah. You know, we, we keep talking about water scarcity nowadays, and I think it's better to characterize the American situation as one of declining abundance. Uh, <laughs> historically, you didn't really, you know, the 19th century laws that you're talking about, you didn't need to do too much because there weren't that many people. There wasn't a lot right. of water, even in the a desert, you know, there was relatively to the population a lot of water. And today what we have is a population compared to the 19th century, which is, is, we are at about 10 times that population. Sure, And at we least. have intensity of use and, uh, you know, which is way beyond what we have seen in the past. So mm-hmm. in a way, even with the same amount of water availability, it, we are cutting the pie many more ways. And so we have declining abundance and we need laws that can assure that with the declining abundance, we can make it. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to have to stop it there. Uh, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much. I hope you'll come back. You did send me that other article to read, and and I'm definitely going to hit you up for that too. But I really appreciate your time today. Sure, no, thank you. This was very nice. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed it too. Um, Fortunately, you have a sense of humor, so it's enjoyable. (laughs) Believe me, sometimes it is not so. Anyway, I appreciate your time and your expertise, especially. Um, Thanks to my sponsor, as always, for supporting this radio station. And we'll see you next time, folks. Thanks for tuning in for this time. So long for now. What Doesn't Kill You, Food Industry Insights, is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe. Hi, listeners. We want to tell you about a podcast we're really digging. It's called Christopher Kimball's Milk Street Radio. Every week, they travel the world to find the most fascinating stories about food, including children who harvest cod tongues after school in Norway and a detective who tracks down food thieves. And on Milk Street Radio, you can always find the unexpected. The comedian who ranks apples using an elaborate 100-point system, the secret history of grocery stores, and how to eat your way through Italy. They also interview the most beloved names in food like Jacques Pepin, Sola Aueli, Jose Andres, Jet Tila, Ina Garten, Nigella Lawson, and Padma Lakshmi. Plus, co-hosts Christopher Kimball and Sarah Moulton do live calls with listeners and answer their questions about ingredients, techniques, and culinary mysteries. Like, why roasting a leg of lamb made one caller's oven explode? Ever wonder why your bread won't rise or your souffle falls flat? Chris and Sarah have the answers. You'll also hear from a rotating cast of contributors, including Kenji Lopez-Alt, Cheryl Day, Dan Pashman from The Sporkful, and Alex Inouz, a French guy cooking from YouTube. Take a listen at 177milkstreet.com radio, or just search your podcast app for Milk Street Radio.